I, I, when I was on the general executive of the Pentecostal Assemblies in Newfoundland, I had uh, several good friends. Two of them were older gentlemen, some of them were ten years or so older than I was, and, uh, and uh, one of them was a, a great moose hunter, and I loved moose hunting, so I'd always want to hear stories. The other guy, like he, he was, I don't think he was, he wasn't really a doors guy, but he loved listening to our stories, but he loved the moose hunter. And they used to travel, you know, we had the Taylor meetings, I'd fly in from Labrador and to St. John's, and, and uh, they would join up in about central Newfoundland and drive to St. John's by, by road across the, uh, across the trans Canada Highway. And if you have traveled in Newfoundland, lived there or visited there, you will notice that all along the way you'll see those incredible signs, watch for moose. And uh, every year we have uh, as much as 40 to 60 moose accidents with probably as many as five to seven fatalities, which is a terrible thing. And so naturally, being a moose hunter, I would always ask my friend that uh, heard him, like when we'd get to St. John's and that little time they would kick back, I'd say, well, I'll just trip in. Oh, great. Uh, did you, I'd say to Barry, did you see any moose? He said, no, didn't see one. I'd look at Hardy and say, that's only you and your wife. He said, yeah, I saw five. <laughs> they, were, they were traveling in the same car. That is not a joke. That's a true story. <laughs> Other times, they Barry, did you see any moose on the way in? No, but I heard it all seven. <laughs> and it would become a great, a great laugh, right? I want to preach tonight on, on lifting up our eyes. What do we see when we lift up our eyes? Came across a, a how, how many, how many know the, 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 the Scotland Yard duel of, of, of uh, Sherlock Holmes and Mr. Watson. How many know about those guys? Well, I'm glad you know that. And I, I came across an interesting story some time ago that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip. After a good meal, they lay down for the night and went to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes awoke and nudged his faithful friend. Said, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, I see millions of stars. And what does that tell you, Watson? Said Holmes. Watson pondered for a moment. His answer was the following. Astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, meaning the science of telling time, I deduct that the time is approximately quarter past three in the morning. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we'll have a fine day tomorrow. Said Watson to Holmes. And what does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes was silent for a minute. Then spoke. Watson, you moron. Somebody has stolen our tent. <laughs> how we all see things It's interesting how we there is there is something inside of us that allows us to get different perspectives on things. And the very familiar path of scripture I want to share with you tonight as I as I as I share this word with you. It's found in John chapter 4. And you read it. You do know what John chapter 4 is. It's the, it's the evening, or the day rather, that Jesus met the woman at the well. I won't go through the story at all because you know it as well as I know it. There's some incredible gems in this, in this, this moment in Jesus' life. And uh, so Jesus meets the woman at the well and they have the encounter and Jesus introduces himself. She believes she runs off to town and, and begins to tell the folk. And all the while, Jesus' disciples have gone into Soviets to pick up a few groceries. And now they come back, and Jesus isn't hungry anymore. And so they kind of wonder, what happened to the matter? So you've got to understand something. Jesus and his band of twelve were ordinary 
people when it comes to their lives, like you and I. They step out in the open, they travel by foot, they, they, they face the same temptations you and I face. They were a traveling band. The only thing that unique about it was the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, and he was revealing himself to, all throughout a three-year period to his disciples who would carry on the message after they had received the power of the Holy Ghost. And so they come back and they say, did he have something to eat? Did, like, did someone give him something to eat? Jesus seemed to be off text when he sent them into the community. They were going in to get something to eat, to buy food and come back, and, 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 and their food would have been very simple. Maybe some dried figs and definitely a, a, a good Italian roll, crusty roll. That would last them for three, four days. And so when they get back to where Jesus is, he's not only interested in food. Some of the disciples say, did, did someone bring him something? Did someone bring him food? He then, of course, began to launch out of the spiritual things, and he said, I have food that to eat that uh, you don't even know. And the 34th verse, he said, my need is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then the 35th verse is so significant. Say not ye, there are yet four months. I've been to Israel, and I've seen the harvest time. And it's an incredible sight to see. Uh, the, the white cotton fields, the, the fruit trees, the, the it's hard to believe that, that, that it's such a, a, an incredibly wealthy little country when it comes to these things. So Jesus was using the illustration of, of, of fruit and, and, and vegetables and, and those things that grow in season to Draw out an incredible spiritual truth to the disciples. He said, don't say that there's yet four hours, four months to harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Jesus challenged his disciples to lift up their eyes and look. See, what they, the disciples, because they were in the culture they were in, probably looked around and said, like, look at okay, guys, you know, we're not necessarily in friendly territory. You didn't understand there was a, a historical conflict between the Samaritans. The Samaritans were part Gentile, part Jew. They were left over from the invasion of Samaria, the Assyrians rather, in about 700 B.C. or uh, there about 750 B.C. when they took Israel and, and took them captive. They left so many Jews in the land and they brought so many of their people into the land of Israel and they intermarried and, and they were neither Jew nor Gentile and so they called them Samaritans. And I'll tell you, the Jew, the pure Jew in Jerusalem had no dealings with Samaritans. So the disciples, no doubt, when they realized they were in Samaria, felt that they were probably in some very, like, not necessarily friendly territory. They were not the Samaritans. And Jesus was saying to them, if you really lift up your eyes and look, you'll see that the Samaritans are not so much a hostile people as they are a harvest ready to be reaped for the kingdom of God. And so while Jesus saw the harvest field, that is, the, the, the disciples probably saw a, a, an hostile environment that the sooner they got out of it, the better. And so there's an incredible lesson here. Jesus then went on to say, and he that reaps receives wages, gathers fruit of a life eternal, that both that he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. And here ended that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I, I just feel in my heart tonight, I just feel that the Lord is saying something to us as a people. I'm preaching to, to us as Pentecostals, this congregation. <coughs> and the Lord is asking us to lift up our eyes because there's so much potential to see different things. And it's how we are connected in the Spirit with the Spirit of God and the Word of God determines what we see when we lift up our eyes. We live in an incredibly multicultural community. 
In fact, the GTA is the most, most multicultural uh, city in all of the world. Canada is fastly becoming the most multicultural country in all of the world. And sometimes there's a tendency for us to see people as a hindrance or as a threat or as a nuisance or as an inconvenience or as something else. Quiet now. But I believe God is saying to us that it's a harvest field. Amen. It's a harvest field. Yesterday morning, in our, yesterday afternoon, yesterday in our women's ministry, we had a, 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 a Hindu lady that, that, that my wife and I have talked to and that a couple in this congregation have been, have been sharing with, and we, got, we invited them to come, and she came yesterday morning and gave her heart to the Lord. Amen. And then, in the afternoon, <laughs> In the afternoon, one of the sisters from the church brought a Muslim lady with her who gave her heart to Jesus. She was here in the service this morning and she was aglow like a light bulb. Amen. Because it's the harvest field. And, and God is asking you and I to lift up our eyes. And to, to begin to see what's around about us. To begin to see the people that's around about us. And, and, and so, so Jesus... There's three things I want you to, to, to share with you tonight. That we must see. There's three things we must see when we look around. Jesus said to his disciples, begin to look, look at the harvest field, not as something you reap down the road, but as something that's right now. Lift up your eyes and behold. And, lift, lift them, and look on to the harvest field. You see, when we look around about us tonight, we've got to begin to see the need. Folk. I, I differ with Tony Campano on a number of things, but, but I do appreciate his forthrightness. Those of you who know his writings know that he's, he's quite, he can get under your skin sometimes. He can become arrogant sometimes. In fact, sometimes he makes you nervous because he tells you the, the, the bare truth. <laughs> and uh, he wrote, a, he wrote a, a, one book called How to Be Pentecostal Without Speaking in Tongues. It was, it, was a, it was a great attempt of, of as a great, it was, a, it was like a side-swiping compliment. He, he complimented the Pentecostals on, their, on, their, on their, their life and vitality and their outreach and their, their, their help sourcing, not sourcing, but, but declaration of the gospel. But he couldn't quite come to accept the dynamic of the physical evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is tongues. He loved what we do, but he just couldn't come there. I say this, say this, say this. I just say that to say this, that I disagree with him on some things. He wrote another book called The Church is a Party. And uh, while he probably was trying to make some good points, I think he missed a great point too. Quote, the church is not a party. The church is the living body of Christ on earth. Carrying out a search and rescue mission for lost souls. Yes. Listen, if you like to party and you feel you're being robbed, hold on, be faithful, we're going to have a party in heaven. Yes. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Yes. We're going to get down and we're going to worship and praise and glorify God and, and we're going to celebrate and then God's going to reward us for our faith. Party time is coming, but it's not now. Too many churches are preaching the gospel and inviting people to come and join their party. That is not the testimony of Jesus Christ. Coming to know Christ is to learn to die daily. Lay down your life. Be willing to give up all that you have. Be willing to be hated by your family. Be willing to do this. Be willing to do this. That's not a party. That's sacrifice. That's dying to self and being alive unto Christ. And we need to understand that God is not calling us to a party yet. He's calling us now to, to give all that we have to reap the harvest before party time begins. And so the, 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 here, uh, this could be a long message, but I'm going to keep it short. Here is what happens. Preachers now and churches now begin to communicate that, come on, join us. We're all having a great time. Don't worry about your sin. God will sort that out. He knows that you. And so you get droves of people calling themselves Christians.
Christians who have not had an encounter with God. And so, then along comes a big mouth preacher and begins to talk about self-denial and death to self and, and the things that God's Word talks about, and people begin to disappear. Now look, I had some party days of my life before I turned 22, 23. And I still remember some of them. And I still remember some leaving when they thought the fun was over. And that's how it is sometimes in the church. If you're looking for a party, you'll come to one church and it's not happening there. You'll go to another church and not you go to another. Then you drift on out of it. All kinds of strange things happen. That's what's happening. You see? But God is not calling us to a party. He's calling us to be his eyes and ears and his heart and hands and feet in a lost world. In a lost world. That's what's and so when we lift up our eyes, we need to see the need. We need to see the need. See, we have some incredible examples in, 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 in the Word of God about men who were moved by the Spirit of God and, 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 and moved and went into action, and the first thing they saw was the need. Nehemiah, for example, and I don't have time to go all here tonight, but you can look it up in Nehemiah chapter 2, particularly verses 11 and, and 12 and 13 and 14 and 17 and 18. He went to Jerusalem out of the captivity from, from Babylon, and, uh, uh, and, and, and he saw the need. The Bible says that he went there, and, and he didn't say a lot to people, but after he got settled in there, kind of, he, he went and done his own scouting. The Bible says he saw Jerusalem broken down. Verse 13 of chapter 2 says the walls were broken down. Now, get, get picture this now. There were literally hundreds and thousands of Jews that had gone back from Babylon into Jerusalem, and they had kind of settled there. No big deal. The walls are down, the gates are burned, the temple is destroyed, but we're okay. You see, they didn't lift their eyes to see the need. I believe the Lord is asking us to lift our eyes and to see the need. And so Jeremiah, Nehemiah saw the gates burned, he saw the distress and the waste, and, and what was the solution? Nehemiah was a great leader. If you ever want to learn about biblical leadership, go to the book of Nehemiah. And you'll get some incredible uh, principles there. Nehemiah realized suddenly that the need was to get this restored. And so the, the solution to the need was to work together in unity. Chapter 2, verse 18 talks about how they had a mind to work. Every man picked up the tools and began to clean up and began to work because Nehemiah saw the need. Job, of course, was another era in the life of, of Israel and, and God allowed Job, the prophet of Job, to see the incredible need in Israel. At that time, of course, Israel was, was, was about to be uh, carried away and, and, and destruction was coming because Israel had forsaken her God. The Bible says that not only did Israel forsake her God, but they replaced her God with other gods that didn't work. That were not real, but they worshipped the foreign gods and the human gods. And God said, because of this, I'm going to visit you. And, and Joel saw that visitation in, in chapter 1, verses 4, 10, and 12 of Joel. It, 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 God allowed Joel to see the destruction by the palm worm and the locusts, the canker worm and the caterpillar. He saw destruction in the fields and vineyards. The joy was departed from God's people. And he saw drought in the fields and rivers. When he looked, he saw and he can understand something. There were literally hundreds of thousands of Israelites living in a land that didn't really see that. Oh, they saw the physical thing, but it didn't communicate into what was really going on behind it. What was the solution? The solution, of course, for Israel at that time, very simple. Chapter 2, verse 12, 13, 17 of Joel says that the solution was repentance. And turn to God wholeheartedly. Here in my text, Jesus saw the harvest field. He saw the Samaritans not as a people to be avoided or shunned, 
of the people who are lost. How do you see a neighbor? I know that's a frightening question. How do you see a neighbor? I have two great neighbors. One next to me, one across the cul-de-sac for them. I've been building relationships and they're great people. Great two young great couples with two children. The great guys are helping out and I help them out and when the new ones. But at the end of the day, I must see them more than just good days. I must see them as folks for whom Jesus died, who need to encounter the love of God. And my destiny on the court on on, on Coat Lane where I live is to be the eyes and the heart of God to that neighborhood. Amen. It's just where it is. Jesus saw the harvest field. He saw the enemy, the thief that he referred to in John chapter 10 and verse 10. He saw the thief stealing lives. He saw the thief killing. He saw the thief destroying. And so he would say the solution is to turn to the good shepherd found in John chapter 10 and verse 10 and 11. I am the good shepherd. The thief comes to kill and to destroy. But I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. So we must understand that we were saved and commissioned on the same night. We were saved Daddy. from our sinfulness and we were commissioned by God to become a lighthouse, to become a light, to become a witness, a testimony. Paul would use the word ambassador. It's an interesting if you study the work of an ambassador. He represents a foreign nation. He represents his government. He comes with authority. He comes with, with support. He comes with, with, with strength to, to another culture. And there he represents uh, his country. We are ambassadors. And so that's the reason why we are, we are called to represent heaven and we're called to represent Christ. Do you know what I'm finding amazing? I had the privilege this morning to share it with a lady who, who knew nothing about Christianity. What's amazing, we have, listen, church, we, we got the heads up. Like, we got the advantage. All other cults, all other faiths, all other non-Christian entities is not based upon relationship. It's based upon fear and works because they know there's something after death and they're hoping they get it all right on this side so it's not too tough on the other side. Even the cults that have sprung up within Christianity, like Jehovah's Witness and others, they do a lot of their work out of fear because they want to make sure their works accomplish their salvation. So it's always a joy for me to be able to tell people who know nothing about Christianity that Christianity has nothing to do with, with, with fear or with works. It has to do with a relationship. You never have to, to, to apologize for introducing people to Jesus Christ. Try it. What a challenge. Give Jesus a sincere chance in your life. And you'll realize something. All of a sudden that you're, you're free of your guilt. And, and, the, and, the, and, and, and when there's a failure in your life, there's the comforting work of the Holy Spirit reminding you you need to be forgiven. But you are saved by the grace of God. That love draws you, not fear motivates you. We gotta love, we gotta one up on, on everybody else. Truly we do. Because Christianity is not about religion, it's about relationship. Now you and I know what religion are you? We used to get asked that all the time. What they really meant and what denomination are you? That's what they really meant. Anglican, uh, Catholic, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Pentecost, who? Salvation Army. Uh, you know, you know, well, what religion are you? Forget it! Let me say it emphatically again, let me heard, I hate religion. Religion put Jesus to death. Religion tore Ireland apart. 
Religion separates most of the small communities in the home province where I come from. Religion cost me my front teeth. <laughs> Literally. I've been taking my front teeth out to prove it to you. <laughs> the Pentecostals would fight the Salvation Army during recess time. One guy, one guy, I'll never forget it, one day picked up a rock, a, a snowball, and he had a rock inside. Yeah. And that's where he got me, right here. On the field.
life, when we begin to see it that way, we begin to get moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. It's incredible when you look at so many times in, in the New Testament that Jesus was moved with compassion. What do we see when we look at the church? What do we see? We see spiritual poverty. One preacher said the greatest sin of America, and it goes for not only South, but for the, the, the American side, but for the Canadian side, is prayerlessness in the church. We have now left the prayer room and gone to do other things that are much easier on the flesh to do and more acceptable publicly, and so we have forsaken the art of prayer. What do we see when we, 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 when we, when we look at the church? We see, we see a lot of distress. We see a lot of spiritual poverty. We see fractured and broken marriages like we see in the world. We see children in rebellion. We see low self-esteem teenagers. We see premarital pregnancies. We see mental and physical illness. We see greed. We see spouses and children enslaved to sin. We see all of these things. It would not be wise to to get in our heads and say, hey, man, sister. We, it would not be wise to see to see all of these things and, 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 and just ignore them. We need to understand what's behind them. And so we need to understand that we are the church. We're the church. And so, excuse me, a soup supper is not to save the loss. It's not going to replace prayer meetings. It's a great evangelism outreach to it, but it won't replace prayer meetings. All the activities that we do will not replace the spiritual essentials, essentials of seeking God and our faith before God and praying through. Amen. Amen. You still with me? Yes. I used to hear that a long time ago. Praying through. You don't hear that anymore. And the obvious reason why we don't. Praying through means persevere. And we're not a generation of perseverance anymore. See, that stupid coffee machine don't pop up that coffee for a dollar for anybody with chicken and rock over another coffee. Isn't that right? We're just always in a big hurry. And it affects our life, church, our spiritual life as much as it affects our physical life. It, it, it's just the way it is. So we need to understand that when we look at the symptoms in the world and look at the symptoms in the church, we need to see what's behind it. The enemy. The enemy. Mm -hmm. So don't be fooled. The enemy is not asleep. He is active. Don't be fooled. We are in a battle. Don't be fooled. The enemy don't mind a fool church if that church ain't praying and walking in obedience to God's word. He doesn't care less. He knows that a church that's not praying, that's not walking in obedience, that's not hungry after God, has no effect upon the community. In fact, it has a bad effect. It is a deadening effect. And I believe that the Lord is asking us to lift up our eyes and to look and to be moved. Our response to, to, the, to, to the, the, what we see should be the same response Jesus had. We must see the need. We must see the need. It, 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 so it's one thing to sit back and say, I don't know what's going wrong with the church. That's one thing. That was a whole different thing to say, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna seek you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna seek you. I don't care how deep the problem is, Lord. If I seek your face, you're gonna come true. You may need to call a brother or a sister and say, "Well, you agree with me. Let's do something." You don't have to go advertising or forecasting it, but maybe you can come it together, come it together. That one morning a week you will rise early together and pray. Do something. There's a solution. It's incredible. The Bible says when Jesus, Jesus was moved with compassion. So what's the solution for this quandary that's going on, this dysfunction in the society, and dysfunction in the body of Christ? What's the solution? I think the solution is very simple, two part. Number one, we need to be looking through the eyes of Jesus. You see, this I've learned. The head and the body are very so closely connected. 
When I get a bad headache, now I run. I, I, that's my only, basically my, my cheap kind of exercise. I run. But when I have a headache, my legs say, don't run this afternoon, don't run tonight. Because my head is connected to my torso. And so whatever happens up here affects this down here. I say that to say this, that we've got to see through the eyes of, I believe Jesus is grieving over a lost world. I never forget the picture that Pastor Mitchell used to have on his, his door. It was a picture of Jesus with the world in a, in a, in a, like a 3D background, and he was weeping. See, sometimes we get angry at sin and we see the, we see the murderer and we see the pervert and we see the, 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 and we want to get our hands on them and, and, and make our way with them in Jesus' name. <laughs> Do it in Jesus' name, that way we would feel good about it, right? <coughs> but Jesus is heartbroken at that. He's heartbroken at And you and I need to be able to be moved with I, I found myself sometimes now when, when, when these things happen and your first response is to take things in your own hands and, and you say the proper thing that he got what he deserved and I realized he is some other son. And maybe he come out of a dysfunctional Christian home we need to understand that Jesus weeps for the lost maybe more than he weeps for the church. That's a theological question. I won't ask it because I have no time to answer it, but I don't know how. But Aaron, what I do know, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, the Bible says he saw the multitude. He was moved with compassion because they were a sheep and not shepherd. Jesus was deeply affected by what he saw. You say, Jesus, the Son of God, was emotionally affected by what he saw? Yes. There's an incredible play on words here. I, I, some time ago, some years ago, it gripped me. I began to look at this. He was moved with compassion. He saw the moment. He saw the crowd. He saw the... And he was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion means that it was so strong in his, in his breast he, that, that it moved him. Either he, 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 either he physically moved or he emotionally moved. I had that experience one time. And I, I thought it was something I, 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 it was incredible. God led me to witness to a Baptist Pentecostal man. And, uh, and, 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 and I, I went to his home, and, and he was at home alone, so it was a great moment to, to, to share out my faith with him. Well, he, he, he was back to him, so to share my concern for him. And I remember we, 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 we talked a lot, and, 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 and he, he, he saw his mistake. He saw that he needed to get back to God, and, and he saw the horrible situation he was in, and he was probably somewhat moved that I would come to his house and just, just feel the spirit of God in me. And I would pray with him. And normally when that happens, I, I pray and we, I feel like, Lord, I've done what you to do. No, I just, just going to get up and move on with my business. I'll never forget it. This time I got to go to my car and there was, and, and there was as if there was, as if there was a, a, a ram, a battery ram pushing on my chest. And in the same moment, the Spirit of God was saying, get to the church. The church wasn't far away. There was no one at the church. It was midweek. And the church was far away. And I, I made my way to the church and, and I, I remember going in, I can't remember if it was a room downstairs or, or a part of the sanctuary, and I just fell on my face before God, and it was as if there was a battering ram on my chest, just just, just pouring out my heart to, to God on his behalf. And I believe it was one of those rare moments when I felt the compassion of Christ. I actually felt what Jesus was feeling in heaven at that time. I really feel that. And I remember, I don't know how long I stayed at the church, and, and then it, it finally passed. But, but he was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. So that's the, that's the level of, of connecting with the heartbeat of God that, that sets us off on a journey 
of, 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 of accomplishing things in the spiritual realm. He was moved with compassion. In Matthew 14 and 14, the Bible says, he saw the sickness and he, and he healed the crowd and healed the multitude. Mark 4, 1 and 14 says that he, he saw the leper and he was moved with compassion and he healed the single need as well as the crowd. Of course, Luke 7 and 13 is the classic example in the widow of Maine where, where death comes out and meets life going in. And he was moved, the Bible said, by compassion by the, by, by the plight of this widow woman. Widow means her husband was dead. The Bible gives us a little insight and says that her only son was being buried. Now, that's tough enough as it is. But in our society, we have some social structures that, 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 that comes alongside of someone like that because of our, our, our democracy and, and we have support. But in that time, there was no support. When your husband was dead and your son was gone, honey, you're on your own. And the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion at the sorrow of that widow woman, and he gave her son back life. When was the last time we were moved with compassion? Many times we become indignant and self-righteous, and, and we want to pass the sentence. What do we see when we look at the brokenness in our, our, our society, even the, the spiritual brokenness in our churches? What do we see? What do we see? What's the solution? The solution is I want to see through the eyes of Jesus. Um, the Lord willing, on, on, on October the 12th, I will begin the seven-part series on Sunday mornings called Text Messages from Another Planet text messages from another planet. Seven part series. What God is calling us as a church to do. It's interesting, in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 33, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. But before the Good Samaritan got to, and you know, you know, you know this? It's the Good Samaritan. It wasn't the Good Israelite. It was the Good Samaritan. But before the good Samaritan got to the man who was beaten and broken and robbed and robbed and left to die, there was two other men got there. One was a priest. What did the priest see? One of them just walked right on by. I mean, that's the ditch. And this is the priest. He just. What did he see? What did he see? He saw not a broken, bleeding man. He saw someone who was defiled. Not good me, not priest, he says. He saw somebody defiled. He saw someone that if he had stopped to touch him would have violated his daily regulations. And they weren't allowed to touch anything as Samaritan in particular. They wouldn't let him go there. Wouldn't let him do that. He saw a man not dying and bleeding on the roadside, but he saw a man who would interfere with what he was called to do. Well, the Levite, he didn't offer daily sacrifices. He was more or less working in the administration of the temple. He, he would do things in the temple. So, he, he was a little more human. He, he uh, walking down the Jericho Road and heard the groanings and the pain coming from the man's heart and body. And he walked over and looked at him. Yep. Yes, some of them are not more human. I bet you're going to make it till midnight. It's not my business. But if you down there to help you, I won't be able to continue my duties. So you walk on. The Good Samaritan, he saw a bloody, broken body that he knew would die if he never stepped in. Now, here are these three men. 
They saw the same thing. What do you see when you see the broken, broken society around you? Do you, do you see an air of self-righteousness? Oh, I'd never do that. How stupid would that person do that? That would never happen to me. Oh, I'm so good. You're so lucky to have that. You know the devil could have had But not to be. I think God bless me a little more. I'm reading everything you well. solution is that we must we must look to the eyes of Jesus. We must look to the eyes of Jesus. You see, the Samaritan saw a man robbed, a man bruised, a broken and beaten, a man needing help. The Samaritan saw the end of the man and said, if I don't do something about this, he did. Second part of the solution is to seek God. There's an incredible little text in Isaiah 64, 7. I don't have time to deal with it tonight. But in 64, 7, uh, God said, there's nobody that stirs himself to call upon my name anymore. We're too busy having a party. We're too busy having a good time. We're too busy just, just messing around. God says, in 64, 7, just, just read that sometime. Let it speak to your heart. God said, there's nobody that will stir themselves to seek me. Jeremiah in, in 12 and 11 says, Oh, that someone would lay the situation to heart. Lay the situation to heart. Joel 2 and 12 and 13 talk about fasting and weeping and mourning and, and, and repentance. Rending of the heart refers, refers to desperation and genuine humility. Joel chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 7 talks about earnestly seeking after God. That's the reason why we as a church got to seek after God. Folks, we got to seek after God. Folks, just tell the devil, no. Tell the devil, no. You're not going to be distracted from the call of God in your life to do things that, that will are not necessarily really sinful, but they'll rob you of that spiritual vitality. Well, Pastor, is that a sin? No. Just if you're messing around with it, you're just going to lose some valuable time. We want what the world wants, and we shouldn't be wanting it. Look, the harvest field is right. And it's a continent daily. This creature daily has got to discipline his life uh, to walk in the ways of God. And sometimes he fails miserably, but he gets up and goes on again. And, and, and we must discipline our lives in such a way. See, we've got to seek God. Seek God. First thing we need to see is the need. Second thing we need to do to see is the, is the solution. And the third thing we need to see is the promise of God. Folk, I preach hard sometimes. It's hard on me to preach sometimes the way I preach. You might not realize that. You might think that I'm just a brazen pastor and preacher. And I get up here and I just tell it like it is. And, 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 and that's, it's not easy. It's never easy. It's never easy. I tell them like it is. I warn. I encourage, but I'm not fatalistic. Folk, he is going to have his glorious church. Amen. That church is not going to hell in a handbasket. He is going to have his glorious church. And that tells me he wants me to be part of it. 
He wants his church to be an overcoming church. He doesn't want his church to be overcome by the world. He wants his church to stand up and overcome the world. I am not fatalistic. The book tells me we won, and the book tells me there are multiplied millions that John couldn't count who were victorious and overcomers. The book tells me that from every tribe, nation, people's tongues under heaven and on the earth, there is going to be people in heaven. Amen. The church is victorious. I know it's easy to say, okay, if, if, listen, I don't know what we're going to make. I don't know, it's just getting so bad I'm going to hang on. He never meant for you and I to hang on. He meant for you and I to stick upon the obstacles and the enemy in the power of the Holy Ghost and be victorious. Amen. 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 Somebody say amen. amen. God's promise is that if we turn to Him, it's so interesting. I don't have time to. I'm not, I've already gone too long. I don't have time to. But in, in Joel, there's three incredible promises given to Joel and Israel, and they apply to the church as well. And the first promise is in Joel chapter two and twenty. If you will turn, if the church will turn, if the church will turn, if I individually will turn, if the church of the body will turn, he he said first of all he would remove the enemy. Wow. He removed the enemy. We are more than conquerors, Paul wrote, through him who loved us. How you doing, brother? I don't know, Pastor. I'm just hanging on. I hope I can make it till Jesus comes. That's the enemy's line. You're going to make it when your faith is in the solid rock, Christ Jesus. He said, I will remove the enemy. And in Joel chapter 2, verses 3, uh, verse 25, uh, 18, 19, I'm going to restore. I'm going to restore. Stop and think what that means. Some have lost some things. They've been stolen by the enemy. Jesus said when we turn to him, when we seek him, when we, when we call upon his name, we begin to see through his eyes, he will restore. If the enemy has stolen something from you, it's not gone forever. That's the devil's lie. God is in the restoration business. You believe that? He's in the restoration business. Don't give up on your boy. Don't give up on your spouse. Don't give up on your neighbor. Don't give up on your girl. Don't give up on those things the enemy has stolen from you. He is a restorer. Jesus Christ is a restorer. Amen. He's a restorer. Some of you want to crap now you're afraid to. Go ahead. Amen. And you want the enemy to hear loud and clear that, that he's defeated. Jesus is a restorer. And the third thing that Jesus promised was that he would revive his glory in the church. It's incredible in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, we, we read it, and, 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 and when we read this, we realize this is the power of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming. He will revive His glory in the church. Don't, 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 don't live like a group of hang-ons. Live victorious. You say, Pastor, that means we've got more problems? This has nothing to do with problems. Paul thought it was a big problem. They couldn't scratch their forehead. You say, what's the big problem with not being able to scratch your forehead? Your hands are in socks and you can't reach it. You ever get a hit you couldn't scratch? Grumble, isn't it? They had a problem. But, were they, but they were not defeated. You may be having a problem. You're not defeated. Amen. And the first thing the devil will get you to do is look at someone and say, see, they don't have any problems. You'd be better off not saved. Or at least if you're saved, uh, not to be any problem to anybody, particularly me, the devil. Just like, be saved, but don't be changed. Keep on just doing the things you always do. No, we don't have to live with that. He revived his glory in the church. And I'm looking for a revival of God's glory. Amen. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I feel my spirit as we, as we prepare our hearts for 
moving forward, that God is going to keep going and going and going, and He's calling us to to a deeper walk with Him. He's calling us as He prepares us for a, a bigger field than He's ever given us. And we need to lift up our eyes and look for the fields are right, ready to harvest. Let me illustrate. Your neighborhood is ready for harvest. I'll bet you seven out of ten homes in your street that if you had the, if you had the relationship that you could sit down with a cop and got past all the all of the niceties and got talking about real things that matter, it would not be long before you'd have an occasion to pray with seven of your ten years. Simply because there is so much stress and strain and dysfunction and worry and torment out there that when they hear someone who cares, they'll have someone who cares. That's right. So what do you see? Do you see a neighbor whose garbage is always blowing across your lawn? They put their garbage in and the swing is blowing and, and, and it always blows on my lawn. I'm going to give them a piece of my lawn. Keep their own garbage. Stupid. Don't put it out of the night. Put it out of the Get up. Don't be so lazy. Get up early in the morning and put it out. It's going to leave it on. I'm going to tell them about their garbage on my lawn. Or do you see someone that really needs to be kind of a little fast? I'm going to send my pastor. Don't know don't send me. You go. You're living next door. Is that cranky one? Start. Show me this driveway during the winter. Guaranteed to leave an impression. He's not in, I am, but he's on the driveway. <laughs> see, I'm talking about how do you see? Lift up your eyes. <coughs> Look on the field. They are right all in the harvest. We need to see the we need to see the harvest field. We need to see through the eyes of Jesus. And we need to see the promises God gives us. He will restore, he will revive his glory, and he will be moved. I believe God speaks to us. Folks, so I feel honored. I feel honored that I can represent Christ. I feel honored. I have an old lady in this city that still wonders what happened to her on Friday night. I have no idea what she was. I have a word of doctor. To get to, to, I had to see the doctor for a few months. I came downstairs and, and I had a few minutes to wait around. And there was a little old lady in a wheelchair. And she had, she had dragged herself up to a coffee bar. She had ordered a coffee. And I showed up and I thanked the girl to get rid of the coffee. And the girl looked at me and said, Do you want something else? Yeah, I'd like to have a medium coffee. And I said, I looked at this lady. I just felt confident. I said, Hi. Do you like a coffee? She said, I got one more. I said to the girl, have you tried here for coffee yet? She said, no. I said, I'm paying for a coffee. Well, the girl behind the desk didn't know what to do. She didn't know that was, uh, she just didn't know what it was. And, and I said, no, I'm serious. I'm, 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 I'm taking care of the coffee for this lady. And, and the lady looked at me, and she was a little embarrassed, and she was a little snot, and she put her head down, didn't quite know what to do, what to hit her, or without setting her up for, for a mugging or, or a love. <laughs> I just said, Mom, I said, I just feel like, I, I, just, I, want, to, I want to buy you coffee today. I just want to And so the lady took my money in, and, and I paid for those coffees, and I walked away. Later on, I saw her at the drugstore, and she was still smiling. <laughs> still smiling. A little after kindness. It wasn't a whole arena for me to say, look, I do this. I I, I, really, I, 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 afterwards, later on, that, I, I should have said to the God bless you, ma'am, and I do this in Jesus' name. I should have said that. I didn't do it. Next time I'll do that. But I think that one of the things we can do is every day say, Lord, this, this, if there's something, this is something with you. I just sent it to you alone, and, and I know she wasn't very well off, but just tell her, at least by a parent, but, you know, it was a little stretch. And I just thought I'd do something. These are the little things that we can do as we seek you. As we seek you through the eyes of